Okay. Hello. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it's a pretty fancy act that preceded me, including a pretty slick outfit there. <laughs> Coming from the beaches of California, it's very special. Uh, I want uh, to stress <clears throat> the notion that ambiguity is the state of the world when you don't know what the variables are. Uncertainty is the situation in the world where you know the variables but not the values. The best paper award addressed that issue. It's a big one. And the other issue is the notion of tension and that it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Holds up some bridges. We need bridges in our systems. OK. We don't have this working now. Did it change? Now the go forward isn't happening. It was working earlier and not working now. I'll reach over here if this doesn't work. Hey, hey, I hope you recognize this. <clears throat> One of the things I want to stress today is the importance of context in virtually all things. There's a tendency in engineering to try to seek universal principles that are context independent. Today, I want to argue for the value of context dependency. And therefore, you need to know something about the speaker. You see on the upper left that he starts off as a kid on the beaches of Southern California surfing. And you've heard that that predicts useless future. But he did manage to uh, enter Stanford as an undergraduate, uh, general engineering science, but he cut thermodynamics and went to Florence for six months. <laughs> that was a good idea. And when he came back, he decided to earn a master's degree in art. Hmm. <laughs> Interestingly, that art program was very human-centric. What's art for? It's for people, by people. What are people from a machine point of view? Do a PhD in neuroscience. How do people do what they do was the underlying research theme. That guy in the middle, he was pretty proud. He had his PhD, introduced himself to an office mate at NASA said, hello, I'm Dr. Leifer. And she said, oh, really? <laughs> and that's the beginning of the decline. <clears throat> First academic position after NASA was at the Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. Good place. The MIT of Europe. Beware MIT guys. They fired me. <laughs> Why would they do that? Well, because actually both of us figured out it was the wrong place for a design engineer when they wanted engineering scientists. Good news, fired. Got a job at Stanford. Survived the 10-year game. Full professor, wow. My wife says that's my standard posture today. <laughs> over the years, I've discovered that evolution isn't over. You've met this guy. Ooh, such a little screen. <laughs> How are we going to run the world on a screen that size? Well, that's my little story, my context. I hope it helps you interpret some of the views I share with you. And this is our context.
Welcome to Stanford. You've been there? Raise a hand. Uh, it's a pretty big sample. Good. I hope you hugged one of those statues. Wow. And that was in 2009. That's the trailer for the International Conference on Engineering Design. Had about 700 people, an international conference much like yours. And wow, because the whole design paradigm has taken off exponentially since the, those years. And that's part of the message I hope to share with you. It's bigger than we thought and I believe more valuable than we've realized. It's also not a fad. It goes back over 60 years. John Arnold uh, is an infamous engineer from MIT. Got fired. Got a job at Stanford. <laughs> Got the message, two messages. Get fired, come to Stanford. <laughs> He launched a program uh, that was joint with the studio art program and advocated that engineering is an art and its implementation demands elegance. And over the years, we've spun off at least a dozen different applications of the engineering design paradigm across disciplines, across schools. And by about 2024, it's heavily internationalized, heavily globalized, which I see as a theme in your program. Beyond just doing it, we have a whole community of people who study how engineers do design. And I'm inviting you to launch a program that studies how systems engineers do what they do. 30 years of doing this, over 40 doctoral dissertations, and in the moment we have advances in design thinking research, a program funded by Mr. Hasso Plotner, co-founder of SAP Enterprise Software. A couple of numbers that uh, surprised me when I saw them, a yearbook or a annual report from the School of Engineering, really? Millions of jobs? Really? 11,000 company spin-offs? Interesting environment to live in. Doing that is an absolutely communicable disease. Ecosystems, big deal. They don't have to be locally constrained. They can be globally networked. Pause. Let me try to get an unwanted blue symbol out of the picture. I can't do it. Okay. Quick show of hands. How many of you have hunted a wild animal? That's about 10%, rather high, and maybe typical of communities. I'm predicting the hands that went up tended to be in the northern climate. In Singapore, with an audience a bit like this, I did that number, put up your hands, zero. My point is that as a culture, as societies, we've lost track of how to hunt for things in the wild. And I can't think of anything more wild than what we call the future. Ambiguous, indeterminate, unbounded, fluid, that's what hunting used to be like. We were good at it, and then we lost track. And now we go to the supermarket, aisle four, level three, to get your meal. When I put up these green slides with words, I beg you to read them. I won't narrate them. I 
I like to amplify in the word relationship. In the 1990s, a lot of systems engineering and design was about human-computer interaction. Somewhere around 2000, 2005, we switched to experience design. But by now, we've realized, especially in our human-robot interaction research, it's about the relationship. And now we redefine much of what we do interpersonally and intercomputer robot as relationships. I want to stress the interrelationship between research and practice. They need each other. Often in life, we separate them, not wise. <coughs> I would like to introduce a little dance to you. For the top statement, that's the science paradigm that I hold in my left hand. In that paradigm, the only knowledge worth having is context independent. The lower text is the design paradigm, where the knowledge worth having is context dependent. We need to balance the equation. That's my mission. Today, the equation is not balanced. Several orders of magnitude difference in the investment in these two paradigms. I invite you to help balance the equation. That's why we need to balance the equation. Total dependency on smart stuff is not very smart. This image bears a special note to those of you who might be in management positions. <clears throat> As a professor type, I'm in a management position. I walk in my lab one day. They've got this two students have another student hanging upside down from this roof. And I'm like, what the devil? <laughs> Drop that guy, and I go to jail. And my job was to say, be careful, and let them do it. So the biggest word I want to share with the management roles you have <clears throat> is the word let. Very dangerous three-letter word. Let other people innovate. The designer in the house is actually <coughs> committed to creating ambiguity. Each time we come up with a new idea, a new product, a new service, a new business, we've increased the diversity of the future. And that increase is adding diver ambiguity. It's not bad. It has value. And you can dance with it. Stress. It's not that people should be I-shaped or T-shaped, but they should know when to be which. The physics paradigm, know what you know. Good. 
the design paradigm, know when and how to use it, the behavior. Build teams. Big emphasis. Individuals are important and critical, but the team is more important. What I find in my teaching is it is hard. It's very stressful for many students entering my course, which is at the master's level. Students come from around the world. All of a sudden, they're on teams. They're doing, dealing with ambiguity instead of problem sets. It's tough. So one of our doctoral students, Michael Lande, launched his dissertation to find out why. His framing of this was to argue that it's hard because we're asking people to, who enter our curriculum mostly as engineers <clears throat> to think and behave like designers. And then we ask them to think and behave like strategic planners. And then we ask that person to think and behave like a manufacturing systems engineer. So having to deal with all four ways of thinking is part of why it's hard. Our curriculum has milestones. <clears throat> we like to call them mission challenges that go into all four quadrants, predominantly design and engineering. And Micah studied the performance of different teams over a four-year period. This is one example. You can see from the black line that they spent most of their time and effort in the design quadrant, relatively little in the engineering quadrant, and zero in manufacturing and foresight. Here's a different kind of team. They occupied all four quadrants, and they moved repeatedly back and forth between the quadrants, the ways of thinking, the ways of experimenting. They produce the wow outcomes very reliably. People in the B format produce what we call thanks. You put in your time, we won't be able to use your outcome. You've been introduced to the pipeline, to the stage gate model, to the waterfall model. All of these models that tend to suggest that if you do step one and step two and step three, you'll be a hero on step 10. Doesn't work that way. The structure of our curriculum is teams of teams. In this example, the team is at Technical University Munich and at Stanford. We teach teamwork by having a teaching team. It's actually learning by copying, by emulating versus lecturing. Each team gets a coach, somebody in the profession regionally who's been through the curriculum and can help guide new people through the process. And in this particular year, we discovered the need for a culture coach. And no offense intended, but let me tell you why. <laughs> These guys in Munich are infamous for planning, planning, and replanning. A lot of communities do that. These guys on the Stanford side are infamous for building, building, and rebuilding. No plan allowed. <laughs> they have to work together. It's very stressful. It's been going on for all my career, 30 years of engagement. The culture defines much of how people think and behave. And we need to work together. Big stress you had on diversity. It's a non-trivial issue. You don't just say it, you work at it. And we have mechanisms for coaching it and teaching it. 
The big dog in our environment <clears throat> is corporate presence. Companies sponsor the projects we work on. In this case, Audi was the sponsor. They put up $150,000 per year to help these two teams go from conceptual to real. Real machines, real modified cars. I'll go light on this, but I want to stress that we spend first 10 weeks exploring the problem space. Company brings a problem statement, we say, well, maybe. We do need finding, benchmarking, try to dis discover what the real problem might be. Then we spend the next 10 weeks trying to explore the solution space. How many ways could we address this problem? Could we solve it? We finally pick one and we reduce it to reality. Make it real, make it functional, technically <clears throat> make it testable by humans. It's a complex organization, paired teams that don't know each other and work internationally separated, two different coaches that see things differently, and maybe particularly challenging is on one side is the industry sponsor demanding a functional outcome, and on the other side is an academic demanding proof of learning. The two are compatible, some tension required. This is a little eye candy for the universities involved in 2013. Hope you can see yours there. The companies involved not just in that year, but over the last 20 years. So it's a very broad spectrum. <clears throat> there are no... In uh, industry barriers to what kind of task we can undertake and when the paradigm is relevant to that. We pay a lot of attention to where our people work for these reasons. We go so far <coughs> as to having built a building with the design community on one side, the engineering community on the other side, and a demilitarized zone in the middle <laughs> to make the tension explicit. It's been working beautifully over the last five, 10 years. Enrollment in our various curricula has been flat. We moved in together and created this explicit tension, and now all things design education, engineering design education are off scale. It's the most in-demand curriculum at the university with computer science trying to catch up. Nothing against computer science, I do that too. On day one, teams are told to Pay attention to your neighbor. <clears throat> this guy might have a good idea. If I don't steal his good idea, I'm not a very smart designer. <laughs> if I don't cite who I stole it from, I'm a bad guy. <laughs> if I cite who I got the idea from, I'm a good guy. Engineering science publication. Pay attention to your neighbors, learn from them. Get off your backside. Put your video conference in the middle of the space, not some isolated place. Guess what? An international jazz combo improv between the group at Stanford and their partners in Sweden, Stockholm in this case. Engineers can do that. An infamous paper bike done by Alto University in uh, Helsinki, really elegantly designed and manufactured, assembled, tested, disassembled, shipped to Palo Alto, reassembled in 12 hours, 
rolled out to the paper bike competition space and failed in the first two minutes. Probably because they didn't test it in deep wet grass versus the lab concrete floor. Real testing in the real world. These tools are in the design space. Heavy emphasis on reflection. What did you do? Why did you do it? What did you learn from it? Our community is visualized as a team of teams. I'm not seeking that you actually read it, but to see that each of these subgroupings is completely autonomous. We have no command control over them. Imagine it, telling faculty at another school what to do. Doesn't happen. But we can work together. Two years ago, after talking about our curriculum as a team of teams, one of my doctoral students introduced me to Stanley's book. If you haven't read it, I encourage you. Anybody read it? I see one hand, maybe two. OK. It's pretty striking that in the face of uncertainty and complexity in the real world, he had to abandon his upper right command control military structure. And over the next 10 years, he managed to implement the team of teams. And for me, this was striking. I don't have anything directly to do with the military. But if they arrived at how to cope with the future with a team of teams, we arrived at it educationally to produce breakthrough innovation. Maybe this notion of systematically coordinating teams of teams is a big deal. Keyes does a nice book, I encourage you to read it, which is another kind of reframing, a re of team of teams, but the focus now is on reimagining the problem space. We place a big emphasis on that. Keyes' book is very readable, takes on lots of social scale problem spaces as systems engineering does. <clears throat> Both of the authors stressed these four words. They had to move to reframing the problem space and the implementation space through teams of teams because of these factors. I'm sure you're all coping with them. And systems engineering is kind of at the bleeding edge of coping. Uh, we have aerospace people in the crowd. This satellite is about three meters across, 10 meters high, a monolithic equipment rack, custom built for each satellite. Takes about nine months to assemble it in Pittsburgh, ship it to Sunnyvale, California. Takes 12 to 24 months to validate that it works. Can you see a user in this picture? Little white things. Lots of little white things. Teams of six to 12 test engineers working 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 12 to 24 months. Wow. I think we know who the human user is. Kevin is the test engineer. He becomes the persona, the model for why we're going to redesign that satellite <clears throat> to make his job easier, better, more effective. Core 
issue was give them a place to work. If you saw this guy, they have to hang from the ceiling to get out some of the upper components. Should be audio you can hear. Sometimes in satellite manufacturing, boxes need to be replaced. Unfortunately, this often happens late in the process. Imagine you wanted to replace a box. This box. It would be impossible to get to it without taking apart the whole satellite. Open space solves this problem. A hinged fixture is used. A crane lifts the strong back to the panel and attaches securely. Allowing the entire panel to rotate down. So you can access the box you need when you need it. You need to know that our sponsor said that's absolutely impossible, can't be done. Five years later, the project transformed the entire business unit, not just the design of a satellite. They redesigned and re-implemented the entire unit. They achieved these kinds of savings on an annual basis. I share these numbers with you in part because it's very hard to get these numbers. We do projects, we deliver breakthrough, it goes into the company, the doors close, the window shades go down, and it's secret. In this case, my doctoral student had sponsored the project. So the big, big message to everyone is find the people in your system that are most susceptible to having their situation improved. Focus on them versus the technology. The construction industry, automated. Joint project with Sweden. Imagine a place far beyond today's limitations. Imagine Volvo machines video. that do the work for you, even without you. An autonomous operation will provide you with time to perform other tasks. If you're not in construction, I can tell you this is reality. These machines, machines are automated, they're running out in the mining industry nonstop and moving into the construction industry. Fully electrified machines and site optimization will reduce your energy consumption to a fraction of today's requirements. Some would call this a vision. We call it the plan. That last line is for real. Workers in the construction zone throwing rocks at the bulldozer to get somebody's attention. It's a big, hairy environment. Machines move, people move, overhead cranes move.
About 80% of the hardware and software of that environment was implemented and tested. No driver. Wow. Warning, 40 ton hauler approaching from your left. Adjust position to your right. All clear. Just imagine being on the streets outside with those autonomous vehicles. Now, what I'm not going to be able to share with you, because I think I'm down to one minute or less, is the research. So I'm going to flash it, observe the people, what they do, include context, instrument everything. Wow, Jester is the most important channel for human communication. You only get people's attention for seven seconds, <clears throat> on average. If people aren't paying attention to you, that's why. Totally documented amongst aerospace systems engineers. Ask a lot of questions. You're going to get a chance in a, in a minute. This is the difference between 40 an hour and 20 an hour. 40 is wow. 20 is thank you. Multiply those numbers by 1,000, the number of hours these teams work together. That's a huge difference. Yes, Most recently, we have notation on the right side that documents how this team is working together. Interaction dynamics language. With it, we get a concrete, measurable, quantifiable record of human interactions doing real technical work. It looks like a DNA record. And therefore, we think it qualifies to be science. We took a body of this data, ran it through the genetic algorithm uh, environment community to find out what patterns matter. And in this example, the, if a human on the team, let's make a team up here, and one of us says, Yes, nice jacket and somebody on the team will say, yes, but look at that skirt. <laughs> and we'll keep having ideas and the, the, the team interacting and communicating with each other, that's the big deal. And here's the case where yes and gets interaction. I accidentally used the but word, it's very bad. <laughs> okay. Fortunately, we share the globe. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Questions, welcome.